never up. Okay, we are here to worship though, so we have we have things to prepare our hearts for. And we'll start by our gathering music uh, with the band singing We Are Here to Worship. The big ones will be on the screen and you're welcome to join us. Love to have you come and enjoy that. 
If you would like to participate, you are welcome to do so. We'll be out in the parking lot, whether allowing or not, we've got that great big space um, down in the Sunday school area. Please invite your friends. This is a great Sunday to say like, hey, you know how I was telling you about our church? Well, we're doing a trunk or treat. Why don't you come to trunk or treat? And then we can stay for fellowship and stay for church and we can check it out. Or if they just want to come for trunk or treat, no pressure, they're welcome just for that too. Um, but if you can get them to stay for worship, even better. Um, otherwise, friends, everything else is in our midweek blast and Sunday announcements. Those emails go out uh, generally on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and there's hard copies in the narthex if you'd like to pick those up. They're on the round table that's kind of towards the first aid, uh, AED box. And with that, I invite you to please, oh, I got it. I almost did it again. You were ready for me. God bless you. Okay. Our secretary, our council secretary, uh, Anastasia, we've been talking about um, the different updates we've been doing around the church. And so Anastasia's got some um, updates on what's going on in leadership for us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Anastasia Carmona. I think I've met many of you, but for those uh, that I haven't met before, it's nice to see you. Uh, and I've been uh, on the church council now for uh, almost two years. Uh, and then, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to get a close look and to get uh, to participate in uh, the work uh, that this church and congregation is doing. Um, and there are a lot of great things, a lot of really great work uh, that is happening in this church and in this congregation. Um, there are also a few challenges that we're facing as a church. Um, primarily over the last uh, number of years, a decline in uh, membership and participation and giving in the church. Um, and that's something that the council has been talking about and focusing on um, and trying to do the work of understanding how the work of the church gets done uh, with fewer resources than we might have had in the past. Um, you've probably seen some evidence of the conversations that we've been having uh, because in order to try to understand this uh, and to make sure that we have a plan uh, for doing the work of the church, uh, we've taken a couple of steps. Uh, one of them uh, is that we know that we need to uh, focus our work uh, and make sure uh, that we have clear steps forward uh, and clear actions that we're, we're taking. And we want to make sure that those are focused around a clear mission for the church. And so last month, uh, Pastor Jenna uh, talked to you about the new, uh, the, the refocused uh, mission uh, of the church, which is really to focus on being a place uh, that people are welcomed, nourished, and fed. Um, in order to make sure that we're doing, uh, doing right, the right things and that we have a plan uh, to really live out and uh, carry out that mission, uh, the council has uh, aligned on three focus areas uh, that we're really going to be investing in over the next uh, over the next short uh, and hopefully long term. Uh, those will evolve, but for right now, um, what we what we are focused on and what we're going to be uh, spending our time uh, and talents and treasures on uh, is really focused on three things: stewardship, welcoming, and family. Um, stewardship, uh, our first focus area, uh, you'll be seeing it come up quickly uh, as we launch into our fall stewardship drive. And it's about making sure that we are being good stewards uh, of the resources and the money and the talents uh, of this congregation, uh, making sure also that we have a stable uh, uh, financial foundation for the church. Because we know that in order for the church to carry out our mission now uh, and well into the future, uh, it's important for us to have uh, stable finances. Um, our second uh, focus area of welcoming. Uh, we hope that you've already seen again some uh, some of the things that we've been we've started to do uh, in the narthex to try and uh, make the space. Uh, modernize the space a little bit uh, and brighten it up uh, and make it a welcoming space uh, as people uh, arrive on Sunday morning. You'll see that we uh, have a number of additional steps planned for the narthex. 
uh, both uh, continuing to open up uh, and declutter the space, uh, as well as to uh, bring, make sure that we continue to have activities in the narthex and on Sunday morning uh, that help people to feel welcomed uh, to come uh, and to stay uh, here uh, at the church. Um, and then our third focus area uh, is family. Uh, you'll see um, us making a conscious effort uh, to invest uh, time uh, and resource uh, in the children, youth, and family ministries uh, for the congregation. Uh, we think that it is vital uh, to the congregation to make sure that we're investing uh, in both the youth and families of today uh, and in the future uh, of the church. Uh, and uh, that, that will, again, allow us to continue uh, our mission now uh, and into the future uh, as, as a congregation. So we think by focusing on these on these uh, these three things, we'll be able to really uh, do meaningful work together uh, in a focused way that will help us to uh, be be the church that we want to be today and to continue to grow into uh, a future that has a lot of promise uh, and that will allow us to continue to do uh, the great work that church has been doing uh, and is, is doing today and to carry that forward. Um, we will have plenty of opportunity uh, for everyone uh, to uh, to participate uh, in in the in this vision for for the church, uh, and we hope that you will uh, be there with us and join in with us uh, to do the work of the church together. Um, if you have any questions uh, about any of that, uh, we'll continue to over the next few weeks uh, continue to give give updates uh, in these kinds of messages during the service. Uh, and then you can also uh, reach out to me or to anyone who is on the church council at any time and we'd be happy to give you more information. Thanks. Um, for those of you who are like, I don't know who's on the church council, let me point them out to you. Um, Anastasia is our council secretary. Heidi Emso is on, although her, her term is coming to a close. So if you're like, that sounds like awesome stuff. I want to be a part of that. Guess what? We're going to have a spot for you in a few months. Um, same here, Nancy Milne, who is also here this morning, and then Molly Durr, who is our vice president. Um, so they can help, uh, at least we can not answer all your questions, but help um, make those connections. I, of course, am always happy to talk with you all or to help build those connections with, between you and a council member or the council as a well. whole. So um, we are so excited for all that God has for us as we move forward. With that, now we do our call to worship. Please rise if you are able. Rise, in the darkest valley, in the at the work. banquet table, in the hard work of life, at the moments of peace, in our day-to-day -day reality, at times set aside, that like this time for worship, for listening, for paying attention, in our every moment, God's goodness and mercy follow us, our hearts overflow. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. We'll take a moment of silence before we continue. Steadfast and faithful God, we have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, the known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. Christ, you are already 
and always
invite you to be seated and we invite our children to come up. And the Person 
that shows up and doesn't bring anything, it's like if you heard about God and Jesus and you said, that's great, I love it, I'm just going to ride along, right? I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to show up to the party and I'm going to be included, but that's it. I'm not going to put any effort into it, right? This Christianity thing sounds great. I'll wear the shirt, you know, but that's about it. I'm just here for snacks, that's right. I'm just here for food. How about that last person?
But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore in them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The word of the Lord. Please rise as you are able as we prepare our hearts for the gospel. Oh, she was my second favorite. Um, 
thank you guys. <coughs> So, all right, let's try this again. So, from the Impressionist to the Chagall windows to the Thorn miniature room, like, I love it. I love all of it. It's our, it's our favorite. We try to go at least three to four times a year, more if we can manage it. We always start at the same place with the Impressionists, but from there, we kind of fan out and decide which direction we want to go. And you would think, given how frequently we go and how often we start with the same exhibit that can be kind of boring, right? I know for some people it's like, eh, I saw it once, I don't need to see it again. But there's always something new that catches my attention. There's always something new that either Alex or I are saying, hey, come over here. I don't remember this being in this painting. Do you remember that? As I wrestled with this text this week, a dear friend and colleague reminded me that we should think of parables like a room or like a piece of art, where every time we go into that space, and for the parables, when we, every time we dwell in God's word, we notice something different. That as we change and grow, how we understand it might change and grow. <coughs> we might notice something different around this time around than we did three years ago. So this time around, what might we notice is different? What has been, re been rearranged or to make the space look quite different? Or what has stayed exactly the same as unchanging as a broken clock? What do we see or hear or experience differently this time? Now, this is the last of the three parables that Jesus shares in response to the religious leaders questioning his authority. All right, so remember, a couple weeks ago, we had the, vi the vineyard and the two sons, right? The one son who said, sure, I'll go do that, Dad, and then didn't do it. And the other said, I'm not doing that, and then went, no, I should probably do it, and did it. And then last week, we had another vineyard owner, but just the one son. <clears throat> now there's a necessary caveat that is especially important with this text. While it functions as an allegory, which an allegory means that it's something with a hidden moral or even a political meaning, that doesn't make it literal or with real life counterparts. Right? It is a fictional, subversive story that is meant to surprise audiences. And that's important because while the king is like God in some aspects, he is not the same as God. The parables show us the truth of God, but don't contain the entirety of God. And then if we confine it to being only an allegorical um, lesson, it reduces what Jesus is trying to teach us. It takes it and makes it something less than the urgent intended message about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven here and now. Remember that, that Matthew's. <coughs> I am so, so sorry, friends. This is the only time this has ever happened to me. So you're getting a first today. Remember then that Matthew's gospel is really focused on the kingdom of heaven here and now. Right? The other Gospels are often kind of looking ahead to what is beyond our life. But in Matthew's Gospel, God's kingdom is here. It's now. It's breaking in. Now we don't have to wait to get it in some far off time. So what is this parable telling us about the kingdom of heaven here and now? And I'll be honest, this passage is one that <clears throat> I really struggled with. I really struggled to find something new in it because I didn't want to look at it. I wanted to look away from it. This is an uncomfortable text, and I don't want to dwell in it. I don't want to consider how God might be like that violent king. So I wonder then, if maybe the new thing that I see this time around is that this parable really isn't meant to show us exactly what the kingdom of heaven is like, but that it is how the kingdom of heaven is often depicted. 
Remember that Jesus has been talking to the religious leaders. This particular interaction began after he flipped the money changers' tables and ran them out of the temple. I know we didn't read that in church, but I think Jesus flipping some tables in his righteous anger is a pretty well-known Bible story. And Jesus does this, and the chief priests are like, Hey, now, who are you again? Who gave you permission to do that? <coughs> in both of the previous parables, Jesus illustrated the ways in which people who had been entrusted with the care of the vineyard were not, in fact, very good caretakers. He's been calling out leadership for failing to care for God's people. Now, thanks to all of the prophet Isaiah's references to the vineyard, the Israel, Isaiah's got a thing for vineyards. If you ever read the book of Isaiah, you know the vineyard comes up a lot. So it's almost certain that Jesus was also drawing upon that understanding of the vineyard for his Torah-educated audience. New Testament Greek scholar D. Mark Davis argues that because of the context, Jesus was warning the religious leaders that they had gotten things very, very wrong. Because the image that Jesus paints in this final parable is one where the kingdom of heaven has a God that seems an awful lot like Herod. A reading from Exodus shows us another time that religious leaders got things very, very wrong. Prior to the particular passage today, Scripture tells us that Moses had been gone for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and nights was all it took for that wandering community to lose their ever-loving minds. Panic sets in quick with us humans, how utterly, ordinarily human of them. Now, a lot of Hebrew Scripture shows us that the people of God really struggled to be people of this one God to end all other gods. They wanted to be like other nations. They wanted to be able to see and touch and physically interact with their God. And so, <coughs> so Aaron gives in. We don't know why or what he was really thinking, only that he said yes and went along with their wild idea. There's a lot of pressure on leaders, and sometimes we say yes to crazy things. But unfortunately, Aaron gets it really, really wrong. That's what idols will do to us. They don't even have to be physical items like this golden calf that they make. We can idolize our beliefs about what it means to be a leader, what it allows us to even do. Debbie Thomas argues that idols lure us with powerful illusions and misplaced hopes. They make seductive promises. The, these false gods come in all sizes and shapes. They promise much, but deliver little. For Aaron and the Israelites, in their anxiety and their desire to just do something, see something, touch something, look at something, they seem said like this was a better way than whatever it was that was in the cloud that was sitting on top of Mount Sinai. Spoiler alert, it was God. They thought that this golden calf was better than God. For the religious leaders in Jesus' audience, cooperating and even collaborating with the imperial Roman forces in Jerusalem certainly seemed better than the other possibility of being wiped off the map. Which by the time Matthew's gospel was written, they had been wiped off the map. Matthew's gospel was written after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. They had already lost everything. And this is how idols lure us in and lure they do. Nothing seems out of place at first glance. It can even look good and respectable. It can look like a feast laid out before an idol. But we say it's meant for God. It can look like religious piety, crossing all our T's and dotting all our I's so that nothing is out of place. And it is in both Exodus and in Matthew's Gospel that God reminds us that it is God and God alone who can satisfy our every need. 
even though we cannot see or hear or touch God in the way we can touch any of our physical representations of God, our sacraments notwithstanding. Now water and bread and wine are pretty great tactile representations of God. A golden calf or the Roman Empire or trying to work hard enough to earn enough or trying to be perfect and never mess up. We can try all those things, but they will never replace God. They can never replace God's grace, God's love, God's mercy. Jesus was critical of the leaders because they had been entrusted with the care of God's people and they were failing to take care of them and to trust God. They had put their trust in themselves and in the empire. And Jesus shows them, shows us that in God's kingdom, that God will and does send the invitation to the party so that everyone else is invited. The first round of invitees weren't going to be the last, but they could have been there. And God invites all the people we wouldn't really think to be included in the invitation. It is an unthinkably open invitation. Don't the servants know any better? If everyone is included, the good and the bad, then you never know who might actually say yes and show up. Like, they can't be here. Not everybody, right? But if everybody is included, then we're included too. If God can turn their anger away from their inconsistent people, then God will turn their anger away from us. When we give ourselves the time and space to look at these really, really hard to read scriptures, and I don't mean linguistically hard, but I mean emotionally and spiritually hard to read scriptures. When we give ourselves that time, we have the opportunity to be amazed by just how far God will go to get us to the wedding feast. When we look and dwell in God's word, God shows us that it is God and God alone upon whom we can rely. That no idol, no position of power, no perfect everything will ever replace God. Not our golden calves, not our perfect appearance, but God and God alone. And because God is in charge, everyone is forgiven. Everyone is invited. Even us. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are all invited in spite of our failures to trust God fully. But his love, it endures forever. Please rise as you are able.
faith that we confess together through the words of the Apostles' Creed that carries us through all of our idols. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and died, was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. For the Church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, that all followers of Christ share the mind of Christ and strive to live together in peace, staying firm in the Lord, God of grace, hear our prayer. For green pastures and still waters, for changing leaves, for beautiful flowers, for all creation that nourishes us. Help us to live in right relationship with it. God of grace, hear our prayer. For the nations of the world and all who hold positions of authority, that they would govern in accordance with God's vision of justice, providing shelter and refuge to all in need. We especially hold the people of the Middle East affected by the violence that is currently occurring. God, we pray for peace. God of grace, we pray for prayer. For all experiencing valleys of grief, that they may be healed and comforted and find rest in the presence of the Good Shepherd who walks beside them. We especially pray for Rhonda's family as they lay her to rest this week. For Laura B's family, who said their final goodbyes last week. For the Gunderson Presha family on the one year anniversary of Steve's death. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for this community of believers that wherever there is conflict or discord, the love of Christ may keep us united and make us mindful of all we do and say. God of grace, hear our prayer. For all those who experience illness or stress, we especially think of and ask for healing for Rosemary and Mary. We ask for continued strength to fight disease or cancer for Annie, Joan, and John. We pray for all caregivers to give them patience and strength. We pray for Sharon for comfort during her cancer treatments. Help them to feel your presence, Lord, through our presence with them and through your presence in their hearts. God of grace, we thank and praise you for Brother John on his birthday today, and we remember Dad Tisco on his 91st birthday in heaven this year, Lord. We praise and thank you for all gifts that you've given us, Help us to use them according to your will. God of grace, hear Gracious God, into your hands we commend for all whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and your amazing grace. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of that peace with one another.
we receive our offerings this morning. Thank you. 
To all those who are worshiping with us from home, this is the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for you. Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world. To the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As we go now from this time of worship, God goes with us and before us, sending us now with this blessing so that we can invite everyone to the banquet. We never might know who will show up. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed. Bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. There is no other name worthy of our praise, no other idol that can fill us with that peace that passes all understanding. There is no other rock except for the rock of all ages, and that's God.
He's invited you to the table, and He is at work in you. Thanks be to God.